just went now. But oh, we are going like, online now. <laughs> I, but we will talk about this for sure. We will definitely sure. be talking about this. <laughs> okay. So let's just see that we're on. Hopefully we're on. Are you watching yourself as well? Yes. As we I do this? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so we're due to start in about eight minutes. So we're just going to have a casual chat now. I know that you're, you know, we, uh, you know, before we go into legal side, we talk about psychological side. So you have never done Facebook Live. You're not really a big fan of using it as well, but you, you're willing to do this. <laughs> well, yes, I know this. Uh, these are challenging times for everybody, so I have to challenge myself a little bit too. <laughs> And how are you how are you feeling doing Facebook Live for the first time? It's actually okay. I maybe it's because I know you, right? So actually, I, yeah. I just feel like how it is when I talk to my daughter who's in Melbourne. Yeah, it's good. It's like a little bit better than doing like a full public, physical public uh, conference thing where you can actually see people. Here, you can't really see anyone anyway, so it's, it feels like you're talking to ourselves only. Actually, no? that, that's what I find daunting because no, I did a webinar doing... last week and I really felt like I was talking to a blank wall. I'm so used to talking to a live audience. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so that makes it easier because you can see people's expressions. You can, yeah. you can tell if they are following you or not and then they laugh at your jokes. So I did this webinar. I made a joke and there was complete silence. Yeah. <laughs> and that kind of threw me because then I began to feel like, oh God, my joke fell flat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, um, <laughs> were you going to say something? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think it'll just be between the two of us then. I'll laugh at your jokes, I promise. But you have to promise to make them funny as well, okay? to <laughs> me. Sorry? I said, I hope I, some jokes occurred to me. No, that's fine. I, I don't think there's anything too funny about uh, the legal side of things, is there? No, no, there no. isn't. And no. <laughs> yeah, we're not exactly well, you known to be a fun bunch either. But I have to say, I love that color of your wall. Yeah, it's really pretty, right? It's really pretty. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got like some nice Buddhist monks on their oh, journey. Lovely. It's, 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 see, look at my study, right? My walls are so like so sanitized and. <laughs> That's a cool. Are there car posters or. Things behind uh, you. you. What is that? These yeah, I can. Cannot. I made them. You made them. Yes, these are cross stitch. Oh, I didn't know so, my friend over here had like the cross stitching in her. Uh, from twenty years ago. This is like when oh, I was okay. when I was still single. My mom said my mom was a bit. Um, of a stickler for doing the right thing so she said every girl has to do some form of needlework and so she said it was an industrious way of occupying myself and this was like you know every time every year the law exams would be in it will finish in june or something and there would be a three-month break right before we start again in september the so-called mm. summer holiday and my mother just said you better do something useful and uh, so oh, I, here you are saving the world. <laughs> You're cross stitching so in other ways now, so. <laughs> yeah. well, I have to say, I kind of enjoyed it. I did so many pieces. I did a table runner. I did. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so well, I'm, I'm sure, sure there was good like... value in that. Yes, I think it taught me patience, if nothing else. <laughs> So it definitely helped you in your job then. <laughs> oh yes, in dealing with difficult, demanding clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, good. We're, we're kind of almost at uh, four now. Santi's here. Hello, Santi. Hello. Um, Hi. And, um, see who's there, is it? Uh, I can see it on my Facebook page. Ah, so okay. I have this screen in front of me, and I also have uh, Facebook on okay. um, on another um, uh, web app. Like um, I've got one on Chrome, and I've got the other one on Safari. Um, Santi says oh. hello back. Hi, Santi. <laughs> okay, so um, we are, we are, um, so maybe I'll just introduce myself and the topic. So my name is Hetel Doshi. I'm an organizational psychologist. Uh, I work with um, a lot of organizations. Uh, many people uh, for psychological success, especially in difficult times. Um, like transformation or what COVID has done, digital transformation. Uh, together with me today, and because of um, because it because I've heard so many people asking what their rights are, um, we have Cell, who is a uh, HR legal practitioner. Um, she's a lawyer partner at Screen, and and also um, recently became really good friends with her as well. So thank you so much for joining us today uh, for one of your first Facebook live sessions. Yes, and perhaps the last, I don't know. <laughs> so, hi everyone, hi. Thank you okay. for inviting me to join you in the session um, and for being patient with me while you know you walked me through everything. Uh, so yes, as um, as Hetel says, I'm a lawyer and I've been practicing employment law for more than 25 years. And just when I thought I knew it all, this happened. <laughs> so this is completely unprecedented for us, um, and um, both for the workforce, the people, you know, the employees, as well as those operating businesses. Um, mm -hmm. None of us have experienced um, a challenge of this level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you said you knew it all before and then this happened. So what do you not know anymore now? Well, it's, um, I wouldn't say not what I don't know anymore because <laughs> okay, that's unsurprisingly, yeah. actually, the same employment law principles, you know, the law hasn't changed. Um, it's just that it is a lot more challenging in the sense that, mm. you know, for those of us who are in the workforce now and as well as the business operators, mm. we have not lived through the war, the Great Depression, and, you know, like mm. in Malaysia, not even the emergency or the May 13th race riot. So this is completely new where something beyond our control actually has control of the whole situation mm -hmm. and it's become a tug of war right because mm -hmm. employee rights have to be protected businesses also have to make sure that they don't go under so mm -hmm. it is it is that so what's new is actually yeah. just trying to keep everything afloat yeah so we'll get into uh, questions already um so one of, you know, um, I, I work with um, quite a lot of wonderful clients. Um, uh, some of them are in a good space right now where they have good reserves and some of them are in uh, re really facing very scary times. And, um, but across the board, all of them have one major concern. All of them feel uh, um, that when they have to get their employees to be physically present anywhere, they they personally feel terrible that they have to do it. And the employees who have to be physically present somewhere, they feel a whole range of emotions as well. Uh, things like, this is unfair, why me, why not others? Secondly, um, I'm risking potentially my life and my family's lives as well, why me? Uh, some companies compensate quite 
well. Um, some companies have asked them to volunteer who might be keen. Um, but regardless of it, there are maybe about 20%, I'm not sure, who have to be physically present um, and are not part of um, the ones who have to abide to this movement control. So what are employees' rights maybe potentially? And by the way, before we go into this, this um, uh, cell, you probably want to do your own self-disclosure about how to take your advice and uh, how not to take your advice as well. Um, so yeah, what, what, what are employees' rights in these times? Okay, so yeah, as uh, thank you for reminding me. I think what's important um, for viewers to remember that this is not meant to be a substitute for legal advice because this is going to be very, very general and each situation can be different. The facts to your relevant, um, whatever it is that you're facing, could make a difference. Um, so just please don't take everything I say as wholesale, you know, um, foolproof legal advice. Yeah, Please check it out. Yeah. Um, with your own lawyers after sharing the full facts with them. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of, you know, whether employees can be asked to go to work, um, can they, uh, and can employees say, oh, you know, I, I, I'm scared to go to work. It's um, the first thing we need to understand is that this movement control order or MCO as we now fondly call it, um, it doesn't say that people cannot work, should not work, or need not work. What it mm. says is that business premises must close. And even when we look at business premises, there are really um, three categories. Yeah? One are businesses that are essential services that continue to operate. In non-essential services that may have obtained approval to operate um, either from Ministry of Health or MIT. And then you have the third category, which are non-essential businesses that didn't apply for or didn't get the approval. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of the first two um, categories, that is essential services and non-essential services with approval to continue operating, um, they can open their business premises and they need to ask employees to come into work. But what they need to do as well is to ensure that steps are taken to minimize the risk, um, the risk of contagion, the risk of health risk to employees. So mm. for both sides, right, whether you're an employer running a business um, and as you say, you're feeling bad because you may be putting your employees at risk here, or if if you're an employee who is, to put it very simply, nervous or scared about going out and going into your work site at this time, uh, remember mm. that even for businesses that can operate, it is not business as usual. Um, mm. First thing is, um, it is only the critical parts of the business that are allowed to continue to op operate from the work site. Mm. So, okay, let's say it's um, F&B business, then yes, everybody who's involved in food preparation and um, mm. packaging, etc., they can go into work, but not mm. the people who are in accounts, HR, etc. Then you mm. need to, uh, employers need to really look at the whole range of um, departments or sectors they have and decide what is essential, what is not, because um, for example, cleaning services would be essential to their food business because if the premises mm. are not kept clean, the food is not going to be safe for consumption, right? So, yes. um, so besides that, there is also an obligation and it's good for employers to know this, that you don't ask your whole workforce to come to work. You're supposed to limit it to 50%. Mm. And they have to take steps. And this would be actually... Um, comforting for employees to know because like the the business has to ensure that they test employees to see if they are free from symptoms before they enter the premises every day. So this yeah. would be 
taking their temperature. They have to provide the employees with hand sanitizer, face masks, which can mm. be a challenge because I understand these things are out of stock now. They also mm. have to take steps to ensure that the workers are traveling straight from home to the mm. site and back, right? So yeah. employees also know that, oh, you know, my, my colleague here is not taking the opportunity to go out of his house and then you know, spend one hour mingling wherever and exposing himself yeah. more and then like exposing me. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are other things um, that employers have to do, sanitize um, common areas three times a day, sanitize workspace before the beginning of each shift, ensure mm -hmm. that vehicles are also sanitized on, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that if employees know these things and they are made aware it might make them feel better and yeah. similarly for employers right if they're feeling bad what they need to do is actually ensure that they're doing everything they can right right yeah that's a good point pay. yeah yeah i i guess one way of employers to stop feeling bad that you know that this is something that has to be done is to rest assured that they are doing everything that they can now, if I'm an employee who doesn't want to go, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be risking my life. I see it as a risk to my my personal life, my human life. Um, what can I do? Okay, so if you feel that risk, it, and it is because you feel your employer is not doing what they ought to do, then you can. I would say that the employee should first. Um, make it known, communicate this, these concerns to the employer and say, look, I, I'm concerned. I don't want to come to work because, you know, this wasn't done, that is not being done, etc." Employees can also lodge a report or a complaint to the Ministry of Human Resource or the Ministry of Health to say that my employer is asking me to come to work, but either I am actually not essential or I, mm. you know, my employer is not sanitizing the place or whatever the concerns are. But if mm. everything that ought to be done is being done, then it's a challenge because it's your obligation to fulfill your, um, you know, your work duties. And if, mm. and if an employee persists in saying no, they could be exposing themselves to disciplinary action. Mm. Right. Um, but, you know, I think as a general, as a general way of being, I think a lot of people, a lot of, I, I might be making assumptions, okay? I'm scared. I don't want to lose my job. <laughs> I, I, I'm i scared first and foremost that my, my okay, my, my family is not going to have money and uh, I'm scared to tell my boss because he might end up taking it the wrong way or firing me. I'm not saying all employees are like this, but I'm just saying this hypothetical scenario, right? So what does a person do then when they are scared about their financial, uh, potential financial consequences? Okay, so I think this, this sort of um, question would arise in any situation, right? An employee is scared to speak yeah. up because they fear retaliation. So it is like anything else. Um, the employee has to understand that if if it is a genuine concern, and of course, I would say better be they better have the evidence for it. Um, then they they should bite the bullet, still make the report. If there is retaliation, then there is always unjust dismissal avenue. Right. That can go right. For. Right. Right. So but then, as, then in the event, they better have. Sorry to interrupt, but with, as with everything else, they better have the evidence. Yeah, I know from a legal perspective, unfortunately or fortunately, there is no room for emotions, isn't it? So that's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, what that's if the all, what if? Work. <laughs> My God, do you legal professionals need to have some level of empathy as well, huh? I'm so scared to go to work. Where's your proof? <laughs> Where's your evidence? <laughs> Uh, all right. So, um, so in light of that, um, um, let's say, for example, there is no evidence. The employee employer is doing everything, but I I'm staying. Say, for example, I'm staying with elder. I'm not, 
But in the event that I'm staying with elderly employees or my wife or my wife is pregnant, um, I have so many small little kids at home who might be, well, I know kids aren't the most vulnerable uh, demographic, but um, maybe because of my parents, I don't want to be in a situation where if I get it, something happens to them. So what would you say? Is that evidence enough? Is that good enough? Uh, no, because the evidence I'm talking about really is the evidence that the employer is not doing what needs to be done to keep the workplace safe. Um, the personal issues that you may have at home, which, which you know, you feel you're in a more vulnerable position than other people, then really I think the, there are only two things to do. One is to talk to your boss nicely and yeah. say, you know, you know, I have an aged parent and I really don't want to take the risk. Mm. Or like I know someone who actually has, who self-quarantines herself every day after work. She, mm. she doesn't eat her meals with the family. She uses a different entrance, uses mm. the room downstairs and just keeps herself away. Mm. Okay, sorry, I just had a request coming in to um, have a chat about um, uh, termination. But yeah, so that's um, that's a separate thing altogether, but we'll definitely get into that. Um, I do empathize, uh, uh, really, I do empathize for those who are living with elderly folks and you feel that you're at a risk. Um, I, I heard about a case of... Um, um, Actually, somebody that I know, her spouse works in um, a particular industry. And when he comes back home, um, they isolate him completely. So, you know, at first and foremost, he's kind of risking his life. When he comes back home, his family is like, you know, you stay in that particular room. Mm -hmm. So not the best scenario for that poor person. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see. There are some questions coming up. There are many who... Um, ah, okay. So, yeah, great. What about... Employers, we get into salary in a bit if that's okay. Well, actually, let's get into it because that's all we care about right now. <laughs> okay, so um, what about employers who are under pressure now to pay salaries but face collection issues? So, like maybe I think we are probably finished, not we probably, we just ended March. So some of them may have had collection issues and for some of the companies that I've spoken to, that's one of their biggest regrets that they didn't complete their collection uh, ahead of time and they've been having a lot of leeway with that. And now they have to play, uh, the employees come today, right? Or yesterday. So yesterday. what can these employees do? Okay, so really the there is no getting out of the obligation to pay salaries, yeah? That, that has to be done one way or another. Non-payment of salaries is not permissible. It's a breach of contract. In a paying reduced salary is a breach of contract. So what I would say really to employers who are facing the crunch is they need to get the employee's consent. So really, I think the the overriding principle in this whole situation is there has to be the right type and right level of communication between both parties as well as people really need to give and take so mm. employees as well you know when they are asked by the employers would you please consider a salary cut they have mm. to be reasonable and understand that you know this is the time when everybody has to pull their weight. If not, um, mm. things could be worse. So it's really mm. consent um, on both sides is required. Yeah, right. Um, um, in case I forget, could you please remind me, because I'm sure you have very good negotiation skills or communication skills in order to be able to get somebody or a client to do something that they may have previously been very... Uh, uh, hello, doggy. <laughs> yeah, so no, I it's have, okay. Yeah, uh, I have two as well. We'll do we'll do a, yeah. a, a a bit of doggy time later as well. So um, yeah. So, so 
uh, yeah, I, I think later I'd like to speak to you about a couple of techniques that you can share as well about how to negotiate or how to communicate in order to be able to uh, get your point across uh, in in sure. a in a way that is palatable for the other party as well. So um, the other thing is that the other question that Santi, thank you, Santi, for your question. There are many who may be un, may be able to sustain only for a couple of months, and then what? Since employees under specific income brackets, uh, since employees under specific income brackets are able to get government support, um, can this amount be done deducted from their salaries to help sustain businesses longer? Sorry, um, I I don't know if I caught the question properly. Um, yeah, me neither, Santi. Um, okay. So there are many who uh, okay. So there are many employees who may be able to sustain uh, themselves for only a couple of months. I'm not sure what that really means, but let's say, for example, I lose a job. I'm only able to sustain myself for maybe even one month. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then what? what? What should I do? Okay, so um, that, I mean, the government did down certain financial assistance for mm -hmm. employees. So if somebody loses their job completely, then, you know, they should apply for these, these um, support that the government is giving. Um, there is also the employment uh, insurance system that will pay out a small amount. But of course, at the end of the day, none of these things are going to be sufficient in the long term. Um, mm. But, you know, I that that's an economical question and I yeah that's not really a legal question is it yeah yeah because yeah. it's so yeah you know, that's, that's not just really a financial yeah. when the when the company doesn't have enough to sustain itself it's going to start cost cutting measures and finally it's going to reach the stage of asking employees to take salary cuts or retrenchment mm. Yeah. So, okay, let's get on the legal side of things. Yeah, that was more a financial kind of a thing, right? Um, uh, okay, so, all right. So, say, for example, I run a company, uh, resources are getting very tight. I need to start laying off people. When and how can I do that? What are the legalities around this? Okay, so if it comes to that, um, our retrenchment laws are actually pretty good in that it, it does protect the employees and it does uh, give the employer very clear guidelines as to what they should do. We have mm -hmm. the Code of Conduct on Industrial Harmony as well, which provides very good guidance. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they need to do if they're going to retrench is mm. to actually look at the various categories of their business. So you need to um, put all your employees who are doing the same type of work, who are in the same job role in, in one basket, right? So you will have different baskets of people. And mm. then within each category, job category, you will have to see if you can make do with less people, and if so, how many uh, how many hits can you reduce by? So, very simplistically, mm -hmm. if you have ten data entry clerks, um, can you make do with eight? And mm -hmm. if you decide yes, I can, then who are the two that are going to lose their jobs? Mm -hmm. So the guidelines actually say that the first lot of people who will lose their jobs those who are foreign nationals so mm -hmm. i must stress that these are foreign nationals within that group yeah so you can't say that well my ceo is an expatriate he should lose his job it is within this pool of people so mm -hmm. if it is your your sales engineers then you're looking within that group of sales engineers mm -hmm. so you, mm -hmm. the first goal would be your foreign nationals then it would be people who are past their retirement age, but you have kept them on on contracts. Mm. And then where uh, finally it would be the um, what we call the last in, first out, mm -hmm. which is the employee with the least amount of service with your company would be the one to go first. 
Mm. And then, of course, there okay. is an obligation to pay retrenchment benefits unless the company mm. is already in such dire financial straits and mm. they don't have the funds to do it. Mm. So, in summary, you have to be very clear about um, uh, the, the the job roles that you no longer need. Uh, then you choose the foreign nationals. Then you choose first in, last out. Or no, then you yeah, choose those who are past retirement age, past retirement age, and then yeah. and then the last, first in, last in, out. first out. Sorry, last in, first out. And what about yes. the poor performers? Them as well. Uh, so you you can depart from the last in, first out if you can mm. if there is a poor performer, but you must be able to actually show that this person show is a poor end. performer. Yeah. Very often, I'm defending a retrenchment case in court. The company's um, defense as to why they picked a person would be poor performance, but then you know appraisals will not show that. Um, mm. There will be just absolutely no documentation to show that this person mm. was any worse than the other. Mm. So this is a time where companies who have not done their performance uh, um, uh, appraisals well would, and if they have to, you know, let go of staff, they're going to be in a difficult position. Do they need to prove that uh, that there's a solid reason, enough evidence to say that they don't need these job positions anymore? Yes. The employer. So they need to. Yes, they need to. Mm -hmm. So typically, if we are talking about retrenchments arising out of this COVID nineteen um, situation, they will have to prove that it resulted in um, financial. You know, it impacted them financially, and the industrial mm -hmm. court is is a very robust court mm -hmm. that the intent as opposed to the superficial face on the face of things sort of evidence. So you have to provide mm. uh, audited accounts to sh show that, mm. um, you know, they really did suffer a loss. And there are times mm. when the court has looked at those accounts and said, yeah, you know, you say you've suffered a loss, but they're actually paper losses, not operational mm. losses. Or on the mm. other hand, they have said, well, that may be so, but how come your directors are still taking home big fat director's fees? How come there were new cars for senior management? How mm. come there was an office trip to Bali, you know? So mm. really, the when the employer comes to the stage where they are thinking of retrenchment, they must, they must have sufficient financial documents independently mm. audited that supports mm. it. And they must also mm. show that they have taken all the other cost-cutting uh, steps that they can take. Mm. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, so they, they have to prove that they've done everything uh, and that they are not spending on um, uh, luxury lu luxury while while making yes. that decision to lay off staff. Right. Um, question over here. Um, two 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 of the similar questions. What can employees do if the company paid their staff half month for the month of March? Uh, let's say, for example, from the 1st to the 17th of March, what can employees do when they were only paid half of it? Is there a government regulation that you cannot uh, suspend pay or you cannot retrench people uh, for a certain period of time? Is there a law or that is going on specific to COVID-19 and the MCO or uh, RMO? So in so far as payment of salary is concerned, there is no specific law introduced because the law is the same. The employer cannot just not pay the salary or half the salary or whatever. And in fact, the Ministry of Human Resource has made that very clear from day one. They have issued FAQs as well to say that you cannot not pay the salary. Salaries must be paid. Similarly, employers cannot treat this MCO period as no pay leave. Mm. So if this has happened to an employee without the employee consenting to it, yeah, let, let me make this clear. You may have an employer who has asked its employees, say, you know very well, we couldn't operate for half the month. Things are really bad. Um, mm. 
cash flow situation is really bad, would you please mm -hmm. take a 20% cut? Uh, that's mm -hmm. a different scenario. But if the employer mm -hmm. has done it unilaterally, the employees can actually report this to the Department mm -hmm. of Labor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or the Ministry of HR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you make a report? So, the challenge, of course, now is that the avenues to make the report to like the Department of Labor and all that is, you know, is to actually go there personally mm -hmm. and fill oh. out a form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, because that's the process that that is in the books, right? In the law books. So, of course, um, nobody thought of, uh, yeah, you know, of there's course. no uh, online um, sure. avenue. Um, but but also to bear in mind that if you made a report today, it doesn't mean that somebody is going to go and wrap the knuckles of the employer tomorrow and say, cough up the salary. It will be something that goes through the legal process um, and the redress may only come in six months. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um so what do employees do then? Let's say, for example, they have not gotten their pay uh, or they only got half their pay. What can they do now, now, like right now, <laughs> legally? Or to take this to a legal process? Is there an avenue at all? Because this is probably the time where, um, you know what I mean? What like, I would, yeah. Yeah. What I would suggest they do is to actually, um, approach a lawyer and there are many lawyers out there who whose practice is focused on um, employees as in claimants and employees they should approach such a lawyer who would advise them what to do or if not um, call one of the department of labors uh, labor uh, those offices um, the, they sorry the yeah. numbers of those departments are available on their website yeah. Uh, make a complaint mm. Mm. and okay. even then it, it is going to be a long process like I said nobody is going to immediately give them the money right, right to help them so not be resolved yeah no. um, and, and, and so um, uh, uh, question now let's say for example I don't have money to get a lawyer <laughs> already no money <laughs> no salary coming in there is the MTUC um, MTUC mm -hmm. will represent that is the Malaysian Trade Union Congress um, they mm -hmm. will represent any employee all right okay um, and um, yeah I, I actually really feel um, a lot of compassion for uh, the employers as well who are going through this I mean as well as the employees who are going through this as well it's also a bit shocking that like you know half a month of no business can be um, out of business, so to speak, as well, right? Um, I know. Yeah, I guess a, a lot of companies have been suffering even before this. So this has just taken a huge big hit as well. Uh, more questions coming in. Um, um, employers who had promised of a bonus uh, in March 2020, um, yeah, so they made an announcement last year. Bonus supposed to be paid out March 2020, but now they're holding on to the bonus. Do they still need to keep to their word? And um, what, do, what do you do if they if you were expecting a bonus and you didn't get it now? No, I'm sorry. I mean, it's one of those things, right? Bonus is, uh, unless it's in your contract that you are entitled to that 13th month salary as bonus or you are entitled to two months contractual bonus, uh, discretionary bonus depends on company's performance. And if they are hit badly now, they can just say that, sorry, we are not going to pay this bonus. When we promised it to you, we didn't expect this to happen. Mm. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a question from Santi. I'm not sure if I still understand it. Employees under specific income brackets are able to get government support. Can this amount be deducted from their salaries so as to help sustain businesses longer? 
So are there some creative things that can be done? So if I understand the question correctly, it is, can employees uh, be asked to take a pay cut to help the business sustain? Is that um, what the question is? Replace the 600 that they're getting from the government with their current salary. Like, say, for example, I'm getting paid 2005. Okay. Well, actually, if I'm getting, say, for example, if I'm getting 2005 a month, uh, I'm entitled to government support of 600 a month. Is that correct? Or is it only if I don't have a job? This uh, wage subsidy program is something where the government has said, we will subsidize. Uh, uh, we will subsidize. Okay. Uh, on condition that, I mean, there are conditions to it. One, the business has to show that it has suffered a 50% drop right, okay, uh, from yeah. January. And secondly, the business then has to basically agree and give an undertaking that they will not retrench their employees for three months from the time they accept the subsidy. Mm. So this, the mm. way I understand it and the, the specifics of it um, have not been released, but the way I understand it is a company, it's a company that applies, yeah, not individuals mm. for the subsidy. So a company would have to say, here are my financial um, statements, and you can see mm. that from January, my income has been 50% or less than what it was last year. Um, mm. I have a thousand employees. Um, mm. I want to keep them in employment. Please give me the subsidy of six hundred ringgit per employee. Mm. Mm. So okay, that, that makes sense, Santi. I, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I hope Santi. I hope that that answers your question. Um, yeah, I think I think even for myself, I wasn't so clear about uh, what the government was doing with regards to wage subsidy and how that was being carried out. So I'm quite clear now that what you're trying to say is that if I, as a business owner, can prove that I've had fifty percent drop in my revenue and I will not be retrenching my staff, then you will give me a 600 ringgit um, uh, subsidy for each of my staff that fall under a certain bracket. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I think maybe that's probably about it. I think majority of people are just concerned about their rights with regards to safety and um, also with regards to um, mm, Salary. So, can you? What about job loss? When are companies allowed to start retrenching? That's a terrible minute, question. But I'll just put it out there. Yeah, but the minute they feel the need to, I mean, um, it's like any other situation. Um, we've had retrenchments before during the Asian financial crisis, or in mm -hmm. fact, the oil and gas industry has been hit quite badly in the past two years, two to three years. Mm -hmm. So it's really. Um, once they feel that the situation is dire enough, they can start retrenching. And uh, anytime, uh, anytime, anytime, starting yesterday. Yes, they of course have to comply with notice requirements. In that, if um, whatever termination notice period there is in the contract, so if your contract has a two months notice period, they have to give it this two months notice. Um, and for those who come within the Employment Act as well, um, there are minimum notice periods to be met, but they can also pay salary in view of notice. Um, the only other notice requirement is they have to file a notification with the Labour Department that they're going to do this retrenchment exercise, and that has to be done 30 days before the termination date. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a lag here. Um, just give me one second, yeah? Just give me one second. Let me just uh, open the door. Hopefully, it's a little bit better now. Hopefully, hopefully. And um, one more question over here. Actually, one of the reasons why we're having this is because I uh, heard from someone uh, about this particular question. Uh, Tanya, Tanya uh, wrote uh, her friend. So the question is,
okay, this is a long question. I'm going to read it and try to make sense out of it at the same time, okay? Would you know if an employee can be given a warning letter or be terminated by a company or employer that does not have a permit from METI to operate as per usual during the MCO work from home quarantine period? Because the employee insists on abiding by the law and working from home. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think what she's so trying to say is the employer doesn't have approval to continue yeah. operation, but yeah. they are asking the employee to come to work. And if she Correct. refuses to go, um, can they take disciplinary action against her? No. And if they do, she would have valid grounds for not abiding by the instructions to go to work. Yes, correct. So, uh, sorry, what, what was your response to that? My response is that if they take disciplinary action against her, um, she would have valid justification for not abiding by the instructions to go to work. Yeah, okay. And how would a company, uh, how would employees know whether their employer actually have a permit from METI to operate as per usual? How would they know? Is this a uh, uh, transparent I mean, thing? Uh, no. So there is like no website or something which has a list. But um, ideally, like for my clients who have applied for the exemption and they've been approved, when they ask the employees to come back to work, we've always advised them that tell your employees, you know, be transparent and say we applied for the approval on this date. We have been granted the approval subject to these conditions and we have fulfilled fulfilled these conditions um so that they know right if not but they course, don't have to show it to the employees they don't have to generally they don't have to but i mean if if i was advising a company and they said the employees want to see it i would say no harm and in fact yeah, i would tell them put a copy of it on the bulletin board put it up on your website you know um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just mm -hmm. um, corporate communications. What if, for example, uh, and I've heard this one before, my company is not allowed to operate, okay? Uh, say for it's a hypothetical question, I'm not talking about my company. Say for example, my company is not allowed to operate, but my customers uh, is and they require products and services. And so therefore my employees need to be on the field to deliver whatever is required to them so it's not a service, indirect essential service or a service that provides stuff for essential services do they still need to have a permit from METI to operate as per usual they need to because you you can't be sending your people out on uh, service calls and delivery route you know mm. you can't do that if you don't have, All right. because you know that there are other aspects of MCO um, mm -hmm. that, that uh, restrict movement. Mm. Yeah, that obviously makes sense as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's about it. But um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that anyone who uh, has any more questions, they who can they reach out to? Who's um, Are there any pro bono lawyers or... Um, well, actually, uh, my firm on day one of MCO, we did put out a notice, and I think it's still there on our website, that we are willing to give pro bono legal advice, preliminary legal advice. Of course, it doesn't extend to drafting of um, documents mm -hmm. and filing uh, and fighting a case in court, but just preliminary stuff for people to know um, where they stand so they, they can contact my firm. I... I don't really know about the other lawyers, but I'm okay. sure that most would be would be willing to just answer, you know, the first few questions. Yeah, that's really kind of uh, your company, and um, I guess uh, in line of that, if any if anybody needs help, try not to flood cell. Uh, like, uh, yeah maybe be compassionate as well but uh, regardless there are there are obviously professional legal companies out there who are willing to listen to you so please feel free to reach out don't go through this stress on your own 
both employers, both employers and employees are suffering together. There is no finger pointing about who's the cause of what. Um, so if you need any help or support, um, please do reach out. Um, so I'm going to take uh, five, 10 minutes of your time if that's okay. Can you teach us one or two or three techniques about negotiation? Oh, okay. Uh, I found actually from my experience, um, the key really is to Actually, generate. can I reframe that? Can I reframe okay. that? I'm so sorry. You know, like how a normal person has a conversation and they can't really, they can't really win in that conversation. Then they get a lawyer and the lawyer can win in that conversation. So what is the difference? Why are you able to win? What do you, what perspective do you have in your head? Um, and how do you deliver that in order to get uh, to a win? Okay, um, I think, um, I've never thought of it that way, but mm -hmm. now that you asked Sorry, me, I, yeah. would, I, I think that it is probably because we put the emotions aside. One of the first things that we learn when we come out to practice is it is a file. It is just a file. So don't, I know it sounds heartless, but Actually, yeah. it's a survival skill for lawyers because if you're going to get emotional about every file, you you can't carry on in in practice. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we you know, like so we're also told there is no there is no point in making enemies over a file. So mm -hmm. you will find that, um, and especially mm -hmm. in the employment um, circle, most of mm -hmm. us are very good friends, and in fact. You know, even in the legal profession, uh, barring, you know, maybe a few, but most are friends or everybody wants to do the right thing, the decent thing. So mm. for us, we, we put the emotions aside. We're actually just looking at the facts. Um, and it sometimes makes negotiations easier because, you know, when, when people talk as individuals, it's it's a completely different ball game, right? Because then you go into the whole thing like, oh, he made me feel this way. He should have understood what he said made me think this way. But if you do it very professionally, these are the facts. Uh, I'm asking you to please uh, compromise on this. And mm. if this, if we can't agree on this, then I'm afraid this this is going to be the outcome. Mm. Um, Mm. So the mindset is one of uh, uh, logic versus emotion. So sometimes you get too emotional. Focus, yes. try to focus. I mean, I just saying this doesn't resonate with me, but it is very important to stay on the logics of what is actually going on. Uh, yeah. in terms of a broader context that also includes the other person. And the second thing that I really like about what you say is um, which is very hard to do when you really are angry with someone. Um, there's no point making enemies. <laughs> That's yeah. really hard. Um, because all you want to, because they are the enemy, right? <laughs> so to say that don't, don't create an enemy out of it is really counterintuitive, but obviously very um, very critical um so can you share with me a couple of techniques maybe like okay so for me um what i have found is it's really important to be genuine and sincere uh people can tell i mean anybody right you can tell as well you don't have to be a lawyer mm -hmm. when somebody is actually talking to you honestly and saying you know, this is the situation, I am sorry, uh, etc. You know, um, the company is doing very badly. You would know yourself that, you know, we are in a business where we go and service our clients at their sites. We couldn't do anything in the past month. Um, mm. So really revenue has been zero. And I'm just asking you, will you please mm. consider a pay cut 20% mm. hopefully for just three months? Uh, mm. We will be the situation every month. And you know what? 
if things really bounce back, even this 20% that you agreed to reduce, we hope to find a way to re recompensate you for it. You know, something like mm -hmm. that. I think that employees are not going to be so unreasonable as to say, no, I just want my money. Because yeah. employees will know that if they say no, then what is the next thing that the business is going to be forced to do? People mm -hmm. are going to start losing their jobs. So if, mm -hmm. if you communicate in a very genuine manner, and even, even in the other situation, as you said, uh, you mm -hmm. know, if you're an employee and you have certain personal issues, they make it very difficult for you to go to work at this time. And it's not just uh, exposing your family to this. Some of them, uh, you know, let's say you have twin kids who are three years mm. old and the daycare centers are closed. Mm. Who's going to care for your kids? They have to go back to work. Yeah. So if you yeah. talk to your employer again very honestly and say, mm. you know, this is the situation, I can't, I can't mm. leave my children at home unattended, either because mm. I'm a single mother or, you know, mm. my husband is, you know, uh, Capacitated, yeah. or I mean, whatever okay. personal circumstances. Right. Yeah. People, you need to talk to the other person at at a very personal level with mm. sincerity, and you have to be genuine. Mm. Yeah, it sounds to me more like doing the right thing. Uh, on top of being genuine as well. Uh, and I think that's very difficult when people feel that they are going to be employers, for example, in this case, when they know that, you know, legally they can be uh, taken to court or whatever it is, it's very difficult to be genuine uh, or reveal all the facts. You probably become across more guarded and stuff like that, isn't it? Um, well, that's not something I would recommend. And in fact, mm -hmm. if you read articles about successful mediation and all that, exactly, um, mm -hmm. they will always tell you it's sincerity. And one of the reasons I, I remember years ago, uh, a judge actually told me that when um, Japan Airlines had a plane crash, at that time at least, um, according to him, uh, it was the only airlines that didn't face civil suits after that because mm. within an hour of the plane crash the ceo of the airlines went on national tv and said i am sorry i don't know yet mm. what went wrong but i am mm. really sorry i feel your grief i you know i feel your loss mm. and this yeah. makes the difference and absolutely you know? absolutely absolutely um so there's actually psychological studies conducted as well in mediation rooms uh, where uh, the power of apologizing um, actually yeah. set a new narrative uh, for for the way that the, the the discussions went forward as well. My God, why can't people? Okay, I'm not allowed to do a rant, right? But honestly, it, see, no, but but, see, but I have sorry, to answer, you know? I would say yeah. the opposite. As a lawyer, if the situation was different, if something has already gone wrong. And uh, you know, I would I would say to my client, oh, for God's sakes, don't don't apologize first because it could be seen as a sign of admission of liability. But in this instance, when you know, when the facts speak for themselves, um, you know, business is bad, everything. Then I think it's really about mm -hmm. really getting through to the employees and saying, you know, times are bad. I, yeah. I never want right. this to happen. Um, mm. This has happened and I'm asking you to please bear with right. us. Right, okay. What's another technique? Uh, maybe we'll just uh, do one last one. What is uh, something that helps you win compared to your clients? Um, and uh, yeah, something that you do differently as a lawyer and it helps you to win. Um, okay, when it comes to negotiations, um, Sometimes when things get heated, then I allow the other person to just rant. And sometimes, you know, nowadays, because we all have our mobile phones with us, so it's very easy to time how long this person <gasps> flies. Oh, my God. I just glance at my phone and I think, okay, 
um, it's 2.32 now. And then the person goes on and on and on and on. Talk, and I allow it. I will let the person rant and say everything. You know, it gives the person an opportunity to just work their anger out of their system. And then wow. after 15 mm -hmm. minutes, and I, I'm, I'm not kidding you, I have been in situations like this where the person is talking for 15 minutes nonstop. And then finally I say, can I now please say something? And half the time the person will say, no, I haven't finished. And then I can say, um, but you know, you've been talking for 15 minutes straight. I would like an opportunity to say something now. And then the person is stumped because then the person thinks, oh, she let me talk for 15 minutes. Okay, I, I need to mm -hmm. be fair and let her say what she wants to say. And then often mm -hmm. I just go back to the beginning thing and say, you know, actually what I asked was this uh, and I would just like to know you know have get your answer to that question and then mm. I don't know why but I think it's just I mean you would know better as a psychologist mm. but I think by that point the person has vented they've said mm. everything they want mm. to say yeah and then yeah. they're in a better place and then they say Oh, so that's your question. You know, in their minds, they're, they're like, okay, so that's your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then very often their comeback will be, so what do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, I've, right. I've said all these things that you've heard me. So what do you want? And mm -hmm. then I will say that, well, I think what could work is A, B, C. Mm -hmm. Mm. And there are a couple of things that you've done really well over here um, that I've, uh, you know, that I'd maybe like to just pay attention to. Number one, You've understood that there are two processes with us, that the two, the two processes working at the same time with a human being. Uh, and if we are filled with an emotional experience, when you throw logic to that person, until the emotional experience is completed, you cannot get into the process of logic. So that's yes. one part of it. Yeah. And yes, the second I, thing that you never you've, thought of it that way, but you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And the second thing that you've said also that I really like, and I don't think you even probably picked up on that. So if the person says, now what do you want? What you've turned it around, because obviously the person's coming with that uh, anger of uh, what you want now, like, like it's about you, the other person, but you've turned it around to say that what I think will, I, what I think will work or what will work for us. So you brought it yes. back to both and you brought it back to something that is workable rather than yes. um, so something that is both centric and workable for both rather than injustice, which is what I want uh, and selfish as well. So the person yes. doesn't feel like they've been, yeah. It's very small tweaks uh, in very crucial moments that um, makes a whole big of diff whole huge difference, uh, emotions and uh, languaging. Did you learn this in school? Or did no, you learn it from watching it others? It was motherhood. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> Mediating the fight between your children, um, <laughs> being in arguments with your children. <laughs> ah, and that's funny. Yeah. Mm, is it true that you can win lots of things at court but not at home? Absolutely. <laughs> so so the third thing with regards to winning then apart from you know uh, uh making sure emotional ventilation is there languaging is there third thing is you need to be in a context where you have some legitimate authority <laughs> no well yeah i mean anyway if you're going to be mediating for a client you have that authority right somebody is giving yeah. you that authority Unfortunately, yeah. you don't have that as a mom, right? <laughs> no, that's the thing. That's the one. <laughs> Lose it straight away. You are crazy and, you know. <laughs> like that, so. uh, yeah, Sel, yeah. I am so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. You can see that there's a Tanya here. Um, Tanya is so grateful. She, um, she just said that um, what you're doing is really selfless for you to be here and having this conversation with us. And I think this is in light of uh, COVID-19 where we're getting a lot of us who may have been very focused on just doing our job and commercializing it uh, to saying we're going to be here for the community. So I really thank you so much for that. And so glad that we are friends as well, that we found a new relationship. I'm really grateful for that. Thank you.
Thank you. It's been you've actually made this fun, Hetel. As nervous as I was about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to show you my dogs here. Hey, Katie, say hi. Hello. And you have two as well, right? No, I have one, but he's gone to yeah. sleep right there on the floor. And uh, not, oh, but you're saying don't wake up. Don't wake us up. Yes. And here's Cleo. Hey, oh, God, so cute. <laughs> they are adorable. They're adorable. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. You take care. We'll catch up offline. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.